On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. All right, I'm gonna pray for us and we will continue. Father, thank you for having us here. Thank you for this time. Um, Lord, thank you for the leadership that has uh, worked to see that uh, this can happen. Uh, the meals can be provided, logistics can be worked out. Thank you so much. Um, Lord, I do pray that this would embody the name in which we, we call it, that this would equip us to better um, live for you in the church, um, in the home, in life. So be with us now uh, and help Jill and I as we work through something uh, publicly in this format like we haven't done before. And so just help us. Thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Okay. All right. So uh, part of this, we're going to tell a portion of our story. <sighs> and we had a really crappy start. Well, that's because I crapped Some my pants. <laughs> On my first date with Jill. That's a true story. <laughs> it's a true story. We went on our first date. Some of y'all have heard the story. But uh, we go on our first date, and we went to this, my favorite restaurant. It's a Chinese restaurant. Japanese. Ja sorry, Japanese, where they cook in front of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they've got all that ginger stuff that's going on, mm -hmm. and it's so good. and Delicious. I, we were in college, and so I wanted to get an extra side of rice because I wanted to take it home for later, you know. I wanted this meal to keep going after we left the restaurant. Uh, I got an extra side of rice. Um, so, Jared, I finished all mine and your leftovers and your to-go order, which I thought was so weird. If you can't finish your order, why would you get more? It was ambitious. He kept eating. But I just cleaned her plate and her box. That's true. Mm-hmm. So then uh, we get to the car, and Jeremy's looking in the trunk, trying to get something out of it. And so. I was buying time. I was trying to pass gas. I had such a severe like, pain in my side, like a real bad gas pain. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Like You feel like it's an appendix issue, <laughs> which I, my appendix went out. When that I had was, nothing to do with this, babe. But I, it's a similar pain. No, it was, that was at least 10 years later. So. I know, but it was a similar pain. It's like, how can my appendix go out if I don't have an appendix? It's yeah, like, okay. Like, so I just needed to pass just to, and be done. But it was loaded. It was not a blank. <laughs> Trusted a fart, and it was explosive diarrhea in my white khaki pants. In her car on our first date. That was our first date. That's cra crappy start. Really crappy start. Yeah. Yeah. I will add this little comment. It popped hot. And that's what gave it away is because when something pops hot, like your neck can pop hot and you're like, I think I'm paralyzed. And you're like, no, it just popped hot. The other pop hot is when you trust a spicy fart that ends up, <laughs> maybe it's just air. Maybe it's not. This one, it was not. So we'll stop right there with the crappy start. It's a true story. It's a true story. That offends you. I'm really sorry. We could talk about such worse things than that. So we were married in a hospital because six days before our wedding, my sister was diagnosed with leukemia, and she had to be in the hospital. Um, and we had a wedding plan that was going to be at our college that, where, we, where we met. And so we replanned our marriage. Our, our wedding in six days. Um, the Uninvited. chaplain became my new wedding planner. We sent out a hundred uninvites to our wedding. Um, and anyway, my sister was able to be there and that was what was important to me. So uh, that's where we got started. Mm -hmm. And then 14 days, we went to Arizona in August for our honeymoon because it was free and I don't understand a thing called climate. And um, we got back day eight. We did a week together in life and day 14 happened. Day 14, 
is something that for those that we've walked through premarital counseling, we've talked about. Um, day 14 was 14 days into our marriage where we looked across the table, probably this close to each other, and we both said almost simultaneously, we've made a mistake and married the wrong person. Where do we go from here? Mm. So we never really had the, a honeymoon, like blissful, everything's awesome. It's like, we're just trying to yeah. put one front, one foot in front of the other at, at yeah. this point, because we just were unhappy. You know, this we we didn't we knew that marriage wasn't going to fulfill all of our dreams in theory, but then we're married, and it's like, oh, that was that was real. Like we aren't going to fulfill each other's like lifelong mm-hmm. lifelong dreams. So, uh, day fourteen was a significant day that neither one of us will ever forget. And, and that and it re. It reappears. Day 14 happens as a metaphor for all marriages, all relationships, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's where you kind of are hit with the reality of, I don't know where we go from here. Um, and so it reoccurs and it plays itself out in other relationships as well. Just day 14 of those moments where you don't know what's going to happen. And it's disappointing, um, sad, frustrating. And then, to, like, in the midst of that very young marriage, 14 days in, just a few weeks later, we found out we were going to be parents. Mm -hmm. Um, And y'all met my mom last week. She's really honest, hardworking woman. And uh, she taught me how to use a tiller, a shovel, post hole diggers, all that stuff. She's a grown woman. And um, (laughs) she says, Jeremy, you're never too big for me to get on top of a refrigerator and start spanking. Um, (laughs) She's just, that's who she is. And so we called her. It's like, we're going to be parents. You're going to be a grandparent. She's like, oh, wow. Um, Okay. Okay. well, this is going to change everything. You know, it's like, aren't you happy? You know, she's like, I am, but it's going to change everything. (laughs) And now we know what she meant. Right. I would probably have the same reaction to JJ being married for three months. Um, But then four months. And then um, a, a year later, your sister passed away. Yes. So my sister did. She battled leukemia for a year and a half, and then she... She eventually did die. When so she was that's kind of, you know, starting our marriage um, with that heavy grief of having lost such a close member of our family was a difficult thing mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, and so we were, you know, we had day 14, um, the difficulties of a newborn, um, the, the grief of a 17 year old sister um, passing. And then we were two states away, we were in central Virginia. Her family's in the upset of South Carolina. She's the only person of her family that's moved more than 30 minutes away from home. <clears throat> her parents are divorced and still live on the same piece of property. Yeah. Um, so, like, their, their family's very tight. Um, <clears throat> we jump right into ministry. And um, when, when we got married, so I was, a, a, you know, already a student minister and a school teacher and basketball coach, athletic director, all these different hats while I was finishing up my uh, final two semesters in college and Jill was working. So that adds a lot of additional um, limitations to how much we could travel during that time to see family. Um, But then we jumped from Lynchburg to to Cary uh, with a newborn, Cary, North Carolina, Um, then to Harrisonburg, Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, beautiful place. Um, and it was just a lot of long days, a lot of long hours, and um, I was driven by um, trying to have a successful ministry, and I did not pastor the home. I, I was unaware of that sort of dynamic, um, and it just created a really uh, unhealthy culture in our home, and looking back, I see it. In the middle of it, it didn't really bother me, uh, but Jill was certainly in a loveless marriage. Um, her husband was just off, like, yeah. away, um, in every sense of the way. Yeah. Um, and this is a, a story, if you want to tell about Bethany, this That's is terrible. Weird. But That's this weird. just gives you the picture of not just who I was, but just what is normal in so many relationships like ours. Yeah, so uh, in H- Harrisonburg is where Bethany was born, Harrisonburg, Virginia, and uh, like Jeremy said, long, long days. I mean, it was, it, it was lonely. I was in a new state. I didn't have many friends at all. And um, 
felt really, I felt like I was trapped in a loveless marriage. That's where I was. Well, the day that Bethany was born, I um, woke up that morning and started having contractions, but I'd already gone to the hospital a few weeks earlier thinking that she was going to be born. And so this day came, and Jeremy had a softball game. And he, he just kept asking me, are you sure that you, are you sure that you're in labor? Like, we don't want to do, what if I go play softball? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like driving myself to the hospital to deliver my baby while my husband goes and plays softball. So that wasn't his brightest shining moment. And then he brings the whole softball. So I call him and I'm like, hey, they're admitting me. I like, you know, I'm, I'm really in labor this time. They're admitting me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he's, he's like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm here. <laughs> um, and, I'm and so, so sorry, y'all. Don't and, <laughs> and so if, if I walk off the field right now, we forfeit. Okay, well, I really need you here. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Uh, so he brings the whole team up to the hospital. Like, they all come to let me see their disappointment <laughs> in this lost baseball game. But he wanted to hit a home run on the yep. night that his daughter was born because this is what his grandfather did. But this just Big kinda... difference between professional baseball and softball. <laughs> but still. But still. <laughs> and uh, Jeremy makes a joke sometimes that I've been married to... What, seven, five or seven? I think seven this husbands. came from a John Piper or something. I think it was um, Woody. He's a film director. Help me. Oh, Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson. Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Allen. Said but, my wife's been married to seven men, of every one of them or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, and so he's definitely, he is a, I don't even know that man that went to the softball field that day because he is completely different in every mm-hmm. way because of, the work that Christ has done with in his heart, which um, we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, so we jump into, on top of all this, we, we uh, leave that context, um, ministry context, go to seminary. Um, and that was strange. I was having to leave Jill in seminary housing, which was like a cave with a door on each end. And um, I would go, I would get up very, very early, go work. I would get in 50 hours, bef- usually before... Thursday noon, I would get 50 hours in, and I could not work more than 50 hours because my boss wouldn't pay me more than 10 hours overtime. But I had to have 10 hours overtime in order to help cover the expenses of our family of two, of two kids, four of us there. And, and I was taking, I think, 15 hours of my master's degree. I remember degree. the bathtub being lo- like lined in um, pillows and blankets. Pillows so that you could sit in there. <laughs> yeah, I turned the exhaust fan on because it was the only quiet place in our cave. So when I'm sleeping, he's studying for so his... So like 2 or um, 3 in the morning, I get classes. up at 5 to go do work. And, yeah, and that's but, what really, I mean, I remember something significant about what I felt during that time because I saw how hard Jeremy was working and I knew this man will do anything he has to do to provide for our family. And so I saw him as a provider mm-hmm. and it gave me a lot of peace and comfort during, uh, dur- during those, during those days. Yeah. And, um, my seminary there at Southeastern uh, can really be boiled down to two things. One is a missions class with one of my buddies, uh, his professor, Dr. Bruce Ashford. Um, and a book he recommended is, uh, let the nations be glad by John Piper that and his lectures, redefined my life and in a lot of ways and um, God, Marriage, and Family by Andreas Kostenberger. He was my professor. He wrote that book, God, Marriage, and Family. Um, He helped. He and David Jones co-authored that book, both my professors. And that's where, those are the two big takeaways for seminary. It's not Greek, Hebrew, exegete, you know, preach, you know, music, nothing like that. It was, honestly, the biggest thing was marriage and family. Um, and that's when things began to change, um, in regards to our home and, um, but then get, get the degree, hop back into student ministry in, uh, North Carolina near Charlotte where Jake was a student. (laughs) Um, welcome to Nashville and here. Um, and, uh, while we were there, we were there for three years and a year and a half in is when the Lord led us into thinking to plant a church. 
and we were assessed by Acts 29 in St. Louis, Missouri, um, 11 years ago I guess it'd be 11 years on the ago. first. Yeah. 11 years ago, November 1st, um, is when I experienced grace in the gospel in a way I'd never experienced it. And the culture in our home went from being law driven mm -hmm. to grace driven. Mm -hmm. And it was also very new. Mm -hmm. um, it was all very different. There was no leverage. When there's grace, there's no leverage. Um, there's no keeping record of wrong when there's grace. When there's law, there's always constantly you're fighting for leverage. You know, you're always fulfilling contracts, right? The if this, then this. But grace considers this, understands this, but it's not held by that. Um, and that started, like that really changed everything uh, for us. And to kind of put this into words, uh, Pastor Dr. Ray Ortland, who was a mentor of mine um, as we first landed here in Nashville, he, uh, he wrote this. He said, uh, this is Mr. Law, Mr. Grace, an article. He says, we were married to Mr. Law. He was a good man in his way, but he did not understand our weakness. He came home every evening and asked, so how was your day? Did you do what I told you to do? Did you make the kids behave? Did you waste any time? Did you complete everything I put on your to-do list? So many demands and expectations. And as hard as we tried, we couldn't be perfect. We could never satisfy him. We forgot things that were important to him. We let the children misbehave. We failed in other ways. It was a miserable marriage because Mr. Law always pointed out our failings. And the worst of it was he was always right. But his remedy was always the same. Do better tomorrow. We didn't because we couldn't. Then Mr. Law died. And we remarried, this time to Mr. Grace. Our new husband, Jesus, comes home every evening. And the house is a mess. The children are being naughty. Dinner is burning on the stove. And we've even had other men in the house during the day. Still. He sweeps us into his arms and says, I love you. I chose you. I died for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And our hearts melt. We don't understand such love. We expect him to despise us and reject us and humiliate us, but he treats us so well. We're so glad to belong to him now and forever, and we long to be fully pleasing to him. Being married to Mr. Law never changed us. But being married to Mr. Grace is changing us deep within, and it shows. So that's the sort of culture mm -hmm. that began to change. Yeah, Jesus was uh, changing Jeremy's heart. And I think he's, he experienced Mr. Grace for the first time during that season of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it just penetrated everything. It penetrated our, our marriage. It penetrated our parenting. Um, and that's what we need the gospel to do in every area of life. I think that we become experts at compartmentalizing areas of life. And something that I've realized lately, just in my own spiritual walk, is that the gospel is, is penetrating. Like, mm -hmm. it's penetrating those areas of my marriage and you know, when I hear Christian songs, I'm just, I'm applying that. When I, when I read scripture, I'm applying it to areas where I didn't before. So look, we're all on this together and I'm just now <laughs> learning how to apply the gospel in some areas, but it's, it's just, it's good for, for all areas of life. It's good. Yeah. And we often will compartmentalize it and not let it speak into certain areas because that means we have to be okay with things not being okay. Yeah. Uh, being offended, being you know, uh, not having things our way or the things that we would like, but the gospel says, no, it's, it's everything. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, moving forward here, uh, we're going to unpack, and we're trying to move quickly so we can have some Q&A at the end. So we're just trying to dump a lot of content as best as we can. Uh, but there's sort of some marriage pillars here that I want to go through that we live by. Uh, what I mean by that is just like truths that we both understand and commit to as a way of knowing the terms of our expectations and relationship and sort of just common understanding that helps us as a foundation 
um, live out our marriage together. Um, do you want to? Uh, we'll start out with our marriage is a covenant. We are in this through the poorest, the worst, and the sickest moments, and we will be together until we die. Yeah, and so on our anniversary, because uh, that's the that's the the negative side of our marriage vows that you heard there, uh, for better or worse, rich for poor. Um, and, uh, and so each year on our anniversary, uh, we'll just look at each other and be like, well, let's go for another year. You know, let's just, uh, continue to show up. You know, something I, I mentioned probably two months ago to Jill was like, you know, honey, like marriage can in a lot of ways just be reduced to continuing to show up yeah. every day, yeah. better, or worse, feel like it, don't feel like it. It's just showing up every day. I'm going to keep showing up to you. And you're going to keep showing up to me. Emotionally empty, emotionally drained, emotionally full, happy, sad. Carrying guilt, giving guilt. Being cruel with my words, being nice with my words. We're showing up. Um, it's a covenant. And I love what Dr. John Piper says. It helps us in this. He says, if you want to know if you married the right one for you, look at your marriage license. And that's been something that during our day 14 moments, that's what we're like, we're focusing on that covenant promise that we made. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, the second pillar is we've got to pursue personal spiritual health. And this is one of the greatest things that you can give your marriage is the gift of you humbly and diligently pursuing God's word and praying and not being anxious and walking uh, not being anxious, but giving things over to him in prayer and walking in ongoing repentance. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most beautiful things that yeah. you can give uh, your, your spouse. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this bit about not being anxious, um, I love what, what Janie Ortland taught me. She was uh, my mentor, mentored me for nine months in her house, and it was intense. It was kind of like taking a college course. So pretty much everything I've learned, she's told me I could just use her stuff, and I, I can just pretend it was mine. But, um, but she, she said, if, if you know how to worry, then you know how to meditate. It's the same muscle. And, you know, when we, when we do have anxieties, when things do come into our lives, um, I'm trying to make it a reflex to turn that into prayer. Like just immediately taking that thought captive and turning it into a prayer. And I think that's a practical way in marriage because, you know, there's lots of anxieties in uh, marriage and singleness. There are a lot of anxieties that we carry and we can immediately try to make that a reflex of just turning that over to prayer. And then we know that a good father has that request. He sees what our desire is. He sees what our worry is and we can trust him. Mm, that's good. Um, the next one, mine didn't print as well. I want to make sure that we're a uh, model marriage. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what happened there? I don't know. It's weird. Well, if a bunch of it's gone, then that's just means y'all get out early. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, another pillar we try to realize is, and, and this ties in our marriage to our parenting is, um, we try to model marriage for our children. And so we're, we try to handle ourselves in our marriage relationship dynamic in a way that gives our children something that they can't get from anybody else. We believe that the greatest gift you can give your children in your relationship, other than the gospel, but through your relationship, your marriage, is giving them gospel-informed, gospel or grace-filled marriage. So the, the number one thing you can give little Johnny is not year-round baseball or, you know, AP classes or opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. Those things are wonderful. That's fine. Pursue that with wisdom and prayer um, and consult baseball coaches who are older and wiser about year-round baseball. Um, and uh, we realized that what we need to do is show our kids what a functioning dysfunctional relationship and, and inspire with the gospel looks like not a perfect relationship, a dysfunctional relationship that is functional because of the grace that's there in the gospel, understanding that and walking humbly with each other. So modeling that is a big deal for us. Yeah. Um, do we do this perfectly? No. no, gosh, no. <laughs> we no. fail we do miserably perfectly. every day, but I think 
we have that as a target, and so at least we can either hit it or miss it. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we do try to do that, and we fail miserably. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, definitely. Um, some things that we um, have found to be helpful, these aren't pillars, these are communication helps, and this is sort of like, this stuff has really helped us in how to talk, okay? Because um, it's really hard to, to talk to your spouse. It's difficult, especially when there's a problem, when you're frustrated. Hearing or talking or talking or hearing is so hard at times. Yeah. Um, so just some communication helps. Uh, one is when Jill brings something to me that either I've failed to do or that needs my attention, and I first become very defensive. I become very fearful that she's dissatisfied with me beyond my fears, and she's going to leave me. No matter really how small or, or how big, it's like you know, I've got a concern. I just like, I'm like, oh, no, like, I hope she doesn't want to leave me. And I get on the defensive, and I begin to try to justify myself. Nothing that she gives me is going to stick. Like, I'm going to prove that I'm trustworthy instead of just listening and receiving, right? And so something that she said, this was probably five, six years ago, um, a significant issue had hit and... And it blindsided us. Mm -hmm. It was an issue that we thought that about five years ago, we're like, well, is this, like, is this an exit ramp? Like, right. where, is this where we get off? Like, we, um, <clears throat> it was a confusing moment in our marriage. Um, and anyway. Yeah. Well, it was probably five, five or six years ago. And um, I think that's when you said, Jeremy, what does it matter if you disciple the whole world and your children don't like you? Mm. It was something to that effect. And it's like, wow. Um, and then um, you had talked about going back home. Yeah. Uh, to Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I was like, whoa. Um, might have been seven years ago because that's when I took my first long sabbatical. Um, I called Nate Wood. He was an elder then. He's in California now. And I was just like, Nate, and he had walked through a divorce himself. And I'm like, man, like, Jill says she wants to go to South Carolina. Like, I don't know what we do. I don't know where we go from here. And so I just, they let me just take a step back for several weeks to give to my family. Um, so after walking for a while, I come home and um, told Jill I wasn't preaching that Sunday. Um, and Jill said, that's the first time in a long time that you heard, I love you, mm -hmm. from me. And um, I was able to really process what the concerns were and see reality when Jill said something to this effect. And this communication help is what I've entitled, Fence Me In. And she said, Jeremy, I love you. There's no one else I want to be married to. There's nowhere else I want to go. Like, I'm in this, and I'm going to work with you through this. Like, we're, we're going to be better on the other side of this. And what I wanted him to, to see is it has to be okay within our marriage for us to have hard things to say to each other. That has to be okay somewhere. And so this is a fence that we drew. With her I words. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. I love you. There's nobody else I want to be married to. I'm not going anywhere. And, uh, I mean, I, I had thought about a temporary separation mm -hmm. by going to Spartanburg, but I wasn't leaving him permanently. Um, and so I, I want to work through some hard things with you. Can mm -hmm. we do this? And that's where he was like, okay. Like yeah, within man. Those, within if you're not going to leave me, fence, let's talk. <laughs> we, can, we can do this. And so we had some really hard things yeah. that we had to work through. But it released me of my greatest fears. It got me off my heels trying to prove myself. And I was able to engage and really listen and consider because I knew the worst case scenario was not going to happen. Right? Does that make sense? Like how I could yeah, just open gonna, up at that point? Yeah. Yeah. And um, moving on. Sure. To the second communication help that I have found. And y'all just have to bear with me because my brain is kind of crazy sometimes. And this is just the image that I get. But when I'm, when we are in a disagreement or in a fight, I don't know what, whatever you want to call it. Y'all know what it We're is. We're chill. We don't get vocal or violent. <laughs> We're both, well, I'm a nine on the Enneagram, so I don't like, 
I don't get too <laughs> ruffled any, any of the time. We're both middle kids. Yeah. So this is about as heated as it gets. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but our words can be powerful. Yeah. You don't have to be loud to yeah. be powerful. That's true. Yeah. Um, but when we're in a fight, I just, I try to get an image in my head. Sorry, I'm going to use volleyball. Okay, that's fine. I said tennis because it makes more <laughs> sense, but. <laughs> but what I see in my head is a volleyball court, okay? Like okay. you're going back and forth. Let's just say you're playing a, like single. It's one-on-one, okay? It's like tennis. <laughs> it's kind of like tennis. You don't get very far. It's kind of like tennis. It's kind of like tennis, but there's a bigger ball, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, bigger wall. I now see what you're trying to say there. And you can't you. necessarily see each other as easily. Oh. I okay, never mind. I was trying. I was trying. See, this all blown, but just try <clears> to bear <throat> with me. Um, I just see a volleyball court where you're going back and forth at each other, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and so I try to visually put myself on the same side of the court as Jeremy um, with my words, with my actions, and in my heart. Um, I need to find a place of humility within myself in that moment. And I need to be able to place myself on the same side of the court as Jeremy so that we can face our true enemy together. Because, you know, we're stronger if we are helping one another see the errors that we have. And so that requires a ton of humility. Mm -hmm. It requires so much just looking, looking inside. And, I mean... You don't have, or at least I don't have to look very far to say, where am I wrong in this? Where am I believing something that's wrong? I can always find that, even probably in this moment right here. I mean, there's just always improper motives. There's always something in my heart that is not lining up in the right way with the gospel. So I need to um, internalize that and try to find a way that I can, can humble myself before the Lord, humble myself before Jeremy, okay, where am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Like, where am I not believing the gospel? Help me here. Like, and, and I'm asking him in that, I'm asking him, be kind, you know, be kind with me. I'm really struggling. And this over here is what I believe, but I need you to help me come to, to know what the truth is mm -hmm. in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the enemy tries to get in and divide and put you at odds. Bottom line. All marriage conflict is, is a root somewhere in sin with the intent to steal, kill, and destroy, period. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It could be a disagreement about whether you show up to 9 or 11 or if you show up at all to church. Uh, it can come from anything, righteous or unrighteous. And <clears throat> knowing that in the midst of this conflict, and we have literally called, if y'all watched Saved by the Bell, uh, we've literally called like timeouts, like Zach Morris style. And walked across the room to each other because we're shouting, or not shouting, we're talking to mm -hmm. each other, um, at each other. And instead, we need to be talking with each other, addressing the true enemy. And then we can work through the, you know, the destruction of what the enemy has already done to our relationship in that given moment. And so standing shoulder to shoulder, we're able to see the enemy for who he is. And be like, where is the enemy trying to divide us? What's he trying to use to cause mm -hmm. us to not like each other right here, right now? Where is he trying to get us to not believe each other or trust each other? Mm -hmm. What can we do to walk in the light so that he can be confused and frustrated? Let's say it. Let's bring it out in the open. Let's confess it. Let's work through it. Let's not hide anything. Let's put everything out. And he, his foothold, his stronghold is gone when that happens. Uh, but it's just another way of trying to consider your how to communicate is understanding that dynamic being like, can I call, can I call a timeout? Like, can we get shoulder to shoulder? Cause I just feel the enemy's trying to do something here that he, he has no right here. Yeah. And, this is not his. And just kind of, you know, like you say, saying to each other, like, this is not my enemy. And mm -hmm. the, like, this is not my enemy in this moment. And that's what I've been tricked to believe mm -hmm. that this you're is my, my enemy. friend, my helper. This is the one who loves me. Like, yeah. this is the one who I've committed. We've committed our lives to each other. This is not the enemy. But there is a real enemy who yeah. seeks to still kill and destroy. Yeah. So identify him as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. And usually something I've realized is I will feel the need to confess something that would just make everything so much easier. Yeah. But my pride is just like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. 
I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And when I feel that, as soon as I feel it and I feel the pushback on not doing it, man, I'm, I'm about 50% right now. I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> but it's like, the earlier you can get that out, the easier it is to say. But the more you harbor it, if you wait 10 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, it'll just keep going on. But if you can just say, I'm sorry for blah, 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 and just throw it out there. The enemy's just like, oh, because he thrives in darkness. He thrives when your words are within. And it's festering bitterness and separation, isolation, resentment, right? Yeah. So just putting it out there as quickly as possible, you know, so that he has no power in that moment. He thrives in secret, in darkness, and in silence. He mm -hmm. thrives. Yeah, and we can, use, we can use those words to disarm the situation, you know, mm -hmm. So. And don't. And a lot of times you'll be waiting. It's like, well, you know, I twenty percent of this is, but eighty percent is her. Yeah. So it's like, technically, <laughs> eight out of ten, she should be going first. Yeah, whoever's got the most fault. So needs I'll to say go I'm first, sorry right? too, but I'm not gonna. And then the gospel's like, no, no, you were full in your guilt, and an innocent person went and took your place. Yeah. So don't be talking about leverage. Don't be talking about who sinned more than the other. It's like just putting that out there. Yeah. Um, this is so important. I mean, I feel like at the heart. Of well, and you even put that in here. I won't. I won't what? steal it. But humility, yeah, is so. Hard. It's the secret sauce of a happy marriage. But it's, it's it. yeah, it is the secret sauce. It is so hard. I know. I know how hard, and I know how risky it feels to humble yourself um, before your uh, before your spouse. It's very risky at times, and so I'm just asking that you try to to practice that humility with one another. Yeah, it's probably risky because in the midst of walking in humility, you, you might be pressed with the fear of enabling, you know? Um, and, and so there, if you're going to have to pick, a choose, uh, pick or choose to go to which extreme, I would definitely choose confession and humility. Um, but if pride is there... I'm not sure how it's going to work out. But if humility is there before each other and before the Lord, your marriage can last a hundred generations, let alone your 55 years. Yeah. Um, if there's humility before God and his word, that means living in light of what he says and not what just feels right in the moment, but living in light of his word, humbling yourself to it, not what you want it to say, embracing what God's objective word says, living humbly before him and humble with each other. Not, nothing, like the gates of hell will not prevail against that. But once there's pride there, the original sin, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But I know for sure if there's humility, you can work through anything. Um, and in regards to this, some, some different... Um, additional communication helps have been um, the conversation that we would have of like, guide me to the cross. And this is where um, we're having to, in the moment, in the live, adjust our expectations. And it can be over what time we leave to go for dinner. Uh, it can leave over uh, what happened with the mail, the newspaper, where you parked the car, what you did for the kids. It, it doesn't matter. This can come from anywhere. But there's just that moment of disappointment and frustration because things did not work out the way you wanted them to. And a lot of times, like if, if you're like me, what I do is I just get quiet and kind of short. You know, it's like, she's like, you know, hey, are you going to go? Because mm -hmm. you want them to feel that. Right? Yeah, I'm trying to like get her to know like, I'm disappointed. I'm a two-year-old kid pouting in a corner right now. And I want you to give me what I want. And I'm not getting what I deserve. I don't, I'm not getting what I want. Like that. Right? And when that sort of thing happens, what we've learned, and I can, there's a number of ways we can fail in that that we're really good at. But what we've had to learn to do is when that happens, and this happened the other day. Maybe we were going on a date or something. I can't remember. Um, out to eat. I can't remember what it was. But Jill said, I'm having to, do you remember what it was? Was it something stupid? I don't know. Okay. I can't remember. Um, I think it was Thursday or Friday. This feels and, risky. Oh boy. And, uh, <laughs> and Jill was like, um, I'm sorry if I'm short right now. I'm having to oh, just yeah, adjust yeah, my yeah. expectations. And like, 
that, right. that lets me know, okay, tread lightly, okay, like, understand, like, she's having to, she's not harboring her lack of uh, met expectations. She's not harboring that and letting it become bitter. She's processing it. She's trying to, in the moment, it's very difficult when your expectations don't work out, especially if they're more significant things. And so she, she I was just kind of like, okay, like, that's cool. Like, I'm glad you're processing that in this way, right? And so giving the space to do that. <clears throat> and then sometimes when it's more significant and you're just really disappointed, it's like, man, I don't know why, like I'm adjusting my expectations and I don't really know why this is bothering me so much, but I'm so mad. Like I'm, I know that there's an idol somewhere that just got knocked off its shelf and I'm angry. It's more than just the date thing. Like I'm, there's something I'm grasping for that I feel like I deserve that I'm not getting, and I need you to tread very lightly and help me find my idol. Help me repent. Like, be my helper. Ask me some questions. Like, I really, I don't want to be bothered in this way to this level over something like this. If you can help me. And that's what I mean by guide me to the cross. Is that, and understand when that's spoken, that it is not an opportunity for payback or revenge. In that moment, you are to work along with the Holy Spirit of God who spoke the world into existence to help bring calm and freedom to the heart of your spouse. Mm. Do not leverage that opportunity for your gain. Mm. Right? That's when, man, when you can begin to speak in that way, that disappointment that becomes passive aggressiveness or some sort of angsty evening of silence, right, um, of sitting where you don't normally sit. Like, well, that's weird. It's like you're a two-year-old <laughs> kid pouting right now, right? But you're able to process, like help each other process and get to the cross. Yeah, and that's really helpful. And it is really helpful when you feel that, when you feel that level of disappointment um, that he's speaking of, to try to dig down and see what's going on in your heart. Try to get there and see, like, where that idol is, um, and and face it head on, and try to confess it. Again, this is risky because, um, I mean, it feels risky. I don't believe that it is risky. It feels risky mm -hmm. to expose these idols to one another, but it's so helpful um, to have a partner uh, who's just helping, helping you see, because they can see a lot more clearly into our lives mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, so, yeah. And what's wild is all this stuff, of course, we're talking about in regards to marriage, all this stuff is applicable to friendship in general. Like how to have functional friendships is, it's the same thing. Like having somebody that you can trust to walk with you in community to help dig for your idol, address these certain things. It's, this is the, really just the Christian community. Um, and then another um, key communication help has been over the years, um, the three postures of marriage. Um, and these are phrases that we use to describe how we feel about our marriage health. Okay. So there's face to face, shoulder, shoulder, back to back. Okay. So we can be going through something, for instance, be like, yeah, I just feel like we've been really shoulder to shoulder for a while. We just need some face to face time. Okay. So here's what these are. Um, face to face, everything's wonderful. You're communicating greatly. Um, this is just when you don't know if life could get any better. Like it's phenomenal. Okay, and you don't really have to fill the void with busyness, or you don't have to fill it with a lot of conversation. You're just enjoying sitting with each other with your cup of coffee, or going on a date, holding hands. Just it's, it's like this is a beautiful season that we're in. Okay, that's face to face. It's intimate, but it's not necessarily sexually intimate. It's just where you're known, fully known, and you're fully loved and. Grace is all around. It's just beautiful. Trying to believe the God, working hard to believe yeah. the gospel with each other. And you've got your gloves up. Okay, there's going to be times that are, you know, that are hard, but at least you're in the fight. Yeah, yeah. You just feel known. You feel present. You feel recognized. There's just a lot of both being very humble with each other. It's wonderful. Um, well, amidst the face-to-face -face time, there's something called life, right? And there's obligations, Okay, you can't live in the fairy tale all the time, but you can still fight to get face to face throughout real life. But real life comes at you and shoulder to shoulder, like two oxen with one yoke, you're together. You're a team. 
okay? You're, you're getting stuff done together. You're buying a house. You're picking out furniture. You're paying off debt. You're supplying uh, you know, financially for your family. You're finding a new church. You're raising like kids. raising kids. It's just like this can be buying a car. It's those moments where you find yourself a lot of, you're present a lot together. Your thoughts and words are a lot together, but there's a third thing. There's that yoke that's there binding you together. It's not just you two face to face. There's a third thing, okay? This is most of life. Yeah, most of life, you're shoulder to shoulder, fighting the drift in order to get face to face. So this is a beautiful marriage, man. When you can just go plow, plow, let's know one another. Let's not get caught up in, in the shoulder to shoulder work because this is false intimacy, okay? So for most guys, um, we understand quantity of time more than quality of time. Typically, at least me, myself, and other men I've talked with. In other words, um, when you spend a lot of time buying furniture together, you're shopping furniture, right? Um, you spent like the whole afternoon together. You feel so close to each other. Like, man, our marriage is amazing, right? It's like, honey, today's been so much fun. Yeah, but I don't really feel like we've connected. I'm like, the, I don't feel like I've seen you all day. And the husband's like, what? What? We've been together all day. Like, I, I don't know what else I can give, you know? <laughs> so, and it's like guys go to a ball game or a movie, come home, and the wife is like, how was it? Like, it was awesome. And we had such a good time. Ladies can go to a movie, and like, you know, the husband asks, like, how was it? It's like, well, it was good. It's, we just didn't really get to we connect. Really we didn't connect. Even talk, you know? <laughs> and so it's like the shared experience is enough a lot of times for guys, though it shouldn't be. Um, and for the women, they're looking for that extra connection, and they should. Like, that's, that is beautiful. Um, but this supplies quantity time, but not quality sort of being known. Now, when you go shoulder to shoulder too long, you go back to back. Shoulder to shoulder without trying to Shoulder to shoulder without or... humility, without intentionally pursuing face to face. You'll get here. And some people stay married their whole life right here. And there's been long seasons of our years that have been stuck right here. Yeah. And God's covenant has kept us together that he has over us, but it's right here. And we feel that. It's like, man, I just feel, I feel like we're back to back and we just need to pursue one another. And that doesn't mean you drop everything in the moment, though that's great if that can happen. It just means, you know what? Over the next couple of weeks, let's be intentional. Yeah. Let's be intentional. Um, uh, an example of, of this that is very, very common is raising children. The common yoke is raising children. And so when the kids get driver's license or go to college, a lot of times there's a separation of the spouses. A lot of times there's divorce in the college years of their youngest child or the high school years because their job is finished. That yoke is gone and they realized that was what was gluing them together. One, the weight of your marriage can only be sustained by the shoulders of Christ, certainly not your kid. And you've got to continue to intentionally pursue FaceTime through this so that when the long days of plowing together, you don't drift once that day's over, but you're able to, to connect um, and know one another. Yeah. You good? You want to? Yeah. So, um, I mean, marriage is sanctifying. It's very sanctifying. It's hard work. Um. A husband sanctifies his wife, and a wife sanctifies her husband. Parents sanctify children, and children sanctify parents. We can talk yeah. about that. But just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's wrong or toxic or to be elim eliminated because uh, sanctification is difficult. And so this, yeah. is, this is what we're in if you're, if you're married and what you can expect if you're not. It is, it's, it's difficult. It requires work. You never get a cruise control in marriage and I don't know Tim and Angie do you get one in parenting do you get a cruise control <laughs> so no cruise control in parenting either so that's <gasps> something I came across I don't remember where I got this um, it might have been something I read in the Times paper but it said in many ways this guy said in many ways parenting can be boiled down to this mm -hmm. this was some sort of psychologist he said, parenting is essentially one generation passing on to another generation its anxieties. Mm. And that's true. 
one generation passing to another generation, it's fears, the way that they view life. Um, and so as we transition to parenting, consider that. Um, but this is, um, I want you to you want lead to this okay, so, portion. Um, These are parenting pillars or kind of like ways that we understand parenting and I don't Ish. know if it's, yeah. Well, okay, whatever. I don't know it's what not it is. pillars. We don't know if it's, but this. We've just, never done this. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all can title it afterwards, but just, if you do have a title and you didn't like it, just try to be nice. Okay? Because it'll hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, you heard some of our story. You heard some of what it was like in those early years of parenting. And um, I was really tired. I was really lonely in my marriage. I was very short-tempered with my kids. And I was positive that I was messing them up Mm. in a really significant way. Um, And I was lacking joy and hope. We had three in diapers at one time during that season. It was hard. (laughs) It was so hard. Um, But... You know, we've gotten through some of the hard, some of those hard early years we've gotten through. And I started thinking through, as I was preparing for this, I started thinking through what would 42, sorry, 40 year old Jill go back and say to 25 year old Jill? So I'm going to get, I, I might get through them. I don't know. Jeremy, you might have to help me. Okay. Because <laughs> it's pretty vulnerable. Uh, So this is in regards to parenting, mostly. Uh, But one, the years are fleeting. You might not feel like it in the season that you're in, but the days are long and the years are short. Two, uh, the joy is full. Three, you are going to love your teenagers. Mm -hmm. Teenagers are awesome. They're so much fun. Um. Four, don't be shy to parent. Um, This is an act of faith. Uh, I think I heard, what is that guy, Paul, David Tripp? Mm -hmm. Is that his name? Yeah, I heard him say uh, that, you know, spanking feels so wrong. I mean, it's just like, you know, but this we do this as an act of faith because this is what we've been told to do. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, Your children do have friends, but they need you as parents. So parent them. Don't. Mm. And look, I'm talking to 25-year-old Jill. I wish I could go back and be her friend. She was so Mm. lonely. (laughs) Um, But don't let up on discipline. Mm. Um, Really and truly. You know, it's very important and it is very loving. Uh, Be clear and consistent. Um, Because to not be consistent is not very fair to the expectations of your child. Um, and, and having gospel dis, discipline, what is that word? Discipling. Discipling <laughs> conversations with the kids, um, and, and just conti- I would, I would encourage her to continue being faithful to what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Five, all parents are in the same boat. Mm-hmm. Some might have more money, some might have more confidence, but they are all afraid. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they all, they all really need to know that, I think. Um, six, God will finish what he started. Mm. Seven, and I'm still not sure about this one because I'm not there yet, <laughs> but one day the house will be spotless and clean. So, you know, people tell me that. So I'm just going to go back and tell her that again because she might need to know that at 25. She did need to. But we're still not there, so... <laughs> Don't, At all. You, you know, yeah, that's bad. Um, this one was yours. Well, this kind of evolved into like what we would tell each other. So mm-hmm. some of these are yours, I think. Um, but you know, God's not depending on you to be a perfect parent. Yeah. He's not depending on you to be perfect. That's not a variable that you're screwing up to mess him up. Yeah. He knows that you're going to be the parent that you are, dysfunctional as all. You know. I would lurk her square in the eyes and I would say, get help. Mm. 
let someone else in, a counselor, a friend. I, I did eventually, but I would have told her, I would have grabbed her by the hand, and I would have taken her to the counselors. And I would have told her, this is the strongest thing you've ever done. So that was very helpful for me, getting help, getting a trusted counselor, letting someone else in to my pain, to my struggle, because I was, I was going at it alone, and I didn't have to do that. And you don't have to if you're in that, if you're in that space. There is help. Um, and 10... Uh, his word doesn't return void, so be faithful in um, putting the word before your kids. We did something called candle time when our kids were little. We would turn off all the lights in the house, and we just had one single candle that was illuminating uh, the word that we could read together. So we all had to be really close to one another, and we would, we would have time together. Because it's so distracting trying to get these young aliens to calm down. <laughs> and... Um, and so turn off all the lights, kids are like, oh boy, you're right. And then you light a candle and they're like, okay, that's a little bit better. And they're drawn into it. And if nothing else, they're just calm for three minutes, um, for you to enact a Bible story that you read to, you know, make it like a skit that they all play a certain role. Um, and we just called it candle time. And at the end, we would need a hero. Larry boy was a big deal in our house when we were younger. And, uh, we need a hero. And uh, one of the kids would blow the candle out, and the hero was needed to turn the light on. And um, so that was candle time. But his word does not return void. Um, when they grow old, they won't depart from it. We believe that. We're still holding to that. That's our hope. Um, and like she said, it's, it's, a, it's faith that discipline, um, you know, is, is the way of parenting. Um, and it's hard because it, it is counterintuitive because you're telling your kids don't hit and then you're spanking them. It's just odd. Um, and so addressing that, addressing with the kids, um, you know, like the Bible teaches this. And um, I'm doing this because I care. If I didn't care, I wouldn't do this. I would like it's so much easier to let you do whatever you want to do, you know. But I'm, 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 I'm doing this because God's word says to do this. And this is love. And the discipline conversation, the gospel discipling moment, uh, some of y'all have heard it, is, um, and I had to do this with Elsie just a couple weeks ago, is there's, um, you know, I get, I get a child to me, and I'm, you know, I say, who, who am I? Um, and the, the child says, your daddy. He says, well, who are you? He says, I'm Elsie. I said, how does daddy feel about Elsie? And... She says, Daddy loves Elsie. Like, you bet I do. And I, I cry every time. It doesn't matter. I cry there, right there, when they say that. Um, and I'm like, honey, like, my love for you should cause you to want to listen and obey. Um, because you're trying to leverage, right, the gospel narrative that we don't love and we don't obey to get love. We're loved, therefore we obey. So my love for you, uh, I'm, I'm wanting my love for you to cause you to trust me and obey. Um, and this conversation, you know, takes place after discipline. And um, to get into the weeds a little bit, we would use a, like a small wooden spoon, you know. And that way our kids weren't getting spanked by our hand because I didn't want my kids to flinch at any point, you know. Um, if they saw me. And, and really the point of discipline, this is maybe getting into the weeds. And I know there's different blogs on all this and stuff. And I'm just, again, I'm looking at scripture and I'm trying to, I'm not trying to redefine what it says. I'm just trying to live in light of what it says. And, um, and so I, I have the kids, um, usually I'll have them put their hands on the closed toilet seat um, or on the mattress. And if they're fighting, if they're dodging, if they're deflecting, like, like I'm, I'm waiting for them to submit to my authority um, as their dad. Um, the one who was going to hold them accountable for their behavior. And um, until that, I, I wait until they're ready to submit. 
uh, I don't like to spank. I don't spank when they're not submitting because that's not the point. The point isn't just to hit. Mm -hmm. um, the point is to follow through with your word. So that's what she said. Don't be, be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, because when you say, come here right now, um, and you don't discipline when they don't, when there's a car and they're near the road and they're three, come here right now, and they don't, well, you've never trained them to because you've been so inconsistent. There's a car right there. Like, don't you wish before that, that you were probably more consistent with your words so that when you say come here now, they'll come here right now. Um, so we, I kind of parent from that sort of concept taking place. Um, but once their will is broken and they've submitted to you, honestly, the, the spanking at that point is so immaterial because you've addressed their heart. You can spank a kid till you're blue in the face and your shoulder is tired, right? And their heart be as hard as a rock. But if they submit to you, it's like that is such precious. That's a precious parenting moment, laced and loaded with grace. Mm -hmm. So I discipline, but not in any way to try to convey a, a point of power through how much pain it inflicts. The pain has already happened in the heart, and they've had to submit to their authority. They are a person living under authority, just like we are to God. And that's what conveys in that moment. Again, a little bit more in the weeds. I've got, you know, a few other thoughts about that. We've got to keep going. Um, but the, God's word does not return void, whether it be candle time, whether it be reading the Bible to them, tucking them at night and praying with them every night. It's all worth it. Weekly church services and gatherings and being a part of an access community, like it is, it is all by faith. It's all by faith. Um, and then you can take Yeah, and 11. so, sorry, this is my last... Uh, thing I was going to tell myself. I could come up with so many more. Um, don't envy. Don't look to other parents and compare, mm -hmm. you know, oh, well, that husband does it that way, and this one, you know, and comparing your children to others, that's just not helpful. Like, and it's not even necessary. This is your cup. These are your children. Mm -hmm. You are their parent. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll share a story that another this is from Janie Ortland too so she's one of my heroes <laughs> um, but we were traveling together one time and she was telling me about um, a girl that they had brought into their home so this was a teenager that had been into trouble uh, in, a, in a troubled situation that they had brought into their home and this girl was giving them a hard time a really hard time and I just thought to myself, this girl is in Janie Ortland's house. Like, I mean, does she know, like, how amazing <laughs> the situation that the she granola, has? The homemade granola. <sighs> yeah. Right? Like, this girl just sitting there to give her a hard time. I just thought, that is crazy. And I just, you know, I was thinking, man, and I said, this, God knew exactly what, um, home this girl needed to be placed in like this is amazing God knew exactly what she needed um and I told that to Janie amidst her telling me some frustrate like, some frustrations that she was having with this girl because of the hard time that they were giving her and so I said Janie I just like God has been so gracious to give this girl to or give you guys to this girl and she said oh Jill, no, God knew what child I needed to have for my sanctification. Mm. And, and that really um, just helped shape the way I view, you know, I mean, we have hard times with our kids. or um, it's, it's just hard. It's, it's the second hardest thing to be married. So mm -hmm. we're going to have sanctifying moments in marriage. And God has gifted us with our children to help us in that process. <laughs> But essentially, I wish that I could go back and tell 25-year-old Jill, trust your Savior and his promises because they are good and they are real and they are true. Something that happened in this building was, I don't know, maybe two years ago, Caitlin's mom. Yeah. Where's Caitlin? Caitlin Logan. Logan. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Your mom has helped us out She's so really much. She's really helped me so much, and she she barely even knows me. But she said something to me right over it here. It was in a Christmas Eve service over here, and she had no idea what I was going through in that moment. It, the Lord just spoke through her mm -hmm. to a situation that I was going through. I feel like the Lord just used her mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was just struggling in parenting, and she was like, 
she came up to me. I don't even think we bar she barely introduced herself. I mean, we're just like, she's like, hey, you know all those things that you're worrying about? Don't. Mm. <laughs> she had been a teacher at that point for 30 years, high school teacher. And she she's it's gonna be just okay. so much wisdom. She's like, it's, she's like all these parents who get all worried about all this stuff. Just don't. Please don't. I was like, okay, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until your son works late last night, an hour. He worked an hour late, didn't tell us, so I went out at midnight trying to find my son. Yeah. yeah. Let's call the cops or try to track him down. Yeah. I didn't know he worked late. That's when it's hard to not care. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, son, I got to preach tomorrow morning, like. I'm not here. Just let me know. He's like, okay, I didn't know you wanted me to. He's like, now you know. You know? <laughs> I was like, hey, man, you're not in trouble. I was scared you were in trouble. Like, big difference. Tracking on the phone is awesome. Well, it can be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Amazing. Is. Enable that. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, enable. That's enabling. Enable. That's good. <laughs> Definitely. That's good. I, I sometimes think through... I haven't ever been asked, so I don't know. Maybe nobody cares, but I'm here in front of you, and I have a microphone on, so I'm going to take this opportunity <laughs> to tell you that if someone were to ask me, hey, Jill, what, what is one of the top uh, pieces of advice that you would give to new parents? This is one of the ones at the top. Um, don't read blogs. <laughs> like... And I say, I love blogs. I love the information that we can get from blogs. But we have a generation that's come before mm -hmm. us that has a lot of wisdom. Go and get face-to-face -face with your parents, mm -hmm. with someone who's been a parent figure in your life, and get your wisdom from them instead of all these blogs. I mean, I don't even know if it's good or real or true or anything, but you have people hopefully in your life that, ha and if you don't have somebody in your life that is a step ahead of you, um, get somebody in your life like that because it's, it just helps. My friend Danielle Fu is someone in my life who I, I remember clearly being in her home and I was like, oh, she doesn't have everything together. Like, is this, I thought all parents just had everything together all the time and it was the first time I realized that she was real um that I was I was gonna be okay I, I realized in that I, I think we're gonna be okay babe <laughs> I think our kids might be too uh, so those relationships can really help keep you grounded as a parent and it's honoring to your parents it yeah. can't even be healing to your parents yeah. um you don't have to take their advice it says, it says, test everything, hold fast to what is true. Um, so that can be certainly honoring. Um, and you turned out okay. I mean, you're in Nashville. You're doing it. They didn't screw up that bad. Cut them some slack. You can be really hard on your parent. Yeah, yeah um, they need a lot of grace. As your kids get older, and I'm just learning this, you'll realize, you know what? I was such a critic of my parents first ten, when I had a 10-year-old and younger. Man, I've got teenagers now. I'm like, wow, my parents did amazing. <laughs> and now I find myself thinking, what did dad do? I'm just going to do that. But I would have never told you that 10 years ago. Never. Um, they need a lot of grace. And Our you've parents got, do. And yeah. we, we can offer that grace to them. And we have, as much as we think we do, we really don't have it all figured out. And I'm talking about all of us. We don't have it all figured out. Um, and, and they have gone before us, and they need grace, and they are on, a, on their own journey and their own trajectory. And so remembering that, you know, they're dealing with their own struggles too. Uh, it, sometimes it's hard to remember that parents have struggles because your, your parents, you know, you probably remember them as they were a little bit older and more developed in their more role. More frustrated with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like you yeah, you did lot. that. You did that to them. So. <laughs> <laughs> they were so cool, and then you happened. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, like last night, driving around to find my son, I'm like, I remember my dad calling the cops on me because he didn't know where I was, and I thought that was the stupidest thing. It's like he didn't trust me at all. No, he loved me. 
And I realized that as I was driving around last night, it's like, man, I gave my dad such a hard time for calling the cops on me for nothing. Like I was just not meeting curfew. But he was worried. He loved me. And just that kind of stuff lands on you, you know. Um, Part of parenting, you've got to adapt in advance. So as you get older, uh, as your children get older, you've got to begin working with them um, instead of trying to work over them. So my boys in particular, uh, when, they, when they reached around 12 years old, I tried talking more to their shoulders, like shoulder to shoulder instead of face to face, because I didn't want to like be domineering over them um, and demanding of them. And so I wanted to kind of be shotgun with them and present it as more take it or leave it Instead of like when they're younger, you're just like, no, you're doing this. I don't care if you like it or not, you're doing it. Um, and there's still moments where it's like that. You know, like I, for instance, um, full disclosure, trying to get JJ to not work this Friday to be at the gentleman's thing. Like that's a big thing for me. And I said it and said it and said it. Then I was like, you know what? I'm not going to force him to be there. I don't want to have to force him to be there. Um, I'm just going to let it be. I'm not going to mention it again. And um, that was my posture on Friday. It's like... I didn't even tell you that. I was just like, he got it all. I know. Yeah. He told me that this morning. And I was like, wow. And I'm glad I didn't have to get to a point where I'm like forcing him to do it. Um, that really, because that way, Friday, it just means more that he's going to be here. Because I didn't make him, you know. Um, but that's, you, you, as they get older, there's, you're not becoming a buddy necessarily. Like, so you're not trying to be a friend. Because, again, they've got those. But your parenting has to shift in order to let them become more independent and free thinking. And that's scary. You have to trust the Lord probably more as they age because you're having to let them make their own decisions um, and not be the critic, uh, but still be the supporter. Um, And so offer ideas. Don't force them to do certain things. Um, But there are times where certain privileges are removed. The physical discipline fades as they get older, of course. Um, Though I got my last whooping. Uh, when I was 17 years old. I weighed 35 pounds more than my dad. He spanked me. I turned around, looked at him, and I said, are you finished? I was so mad. And he's like, I think I'm totally finished. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. He's like, we're not doing this again. Um, was the look in his eye. And, um, and so I thought to myself, yeah, I don't want to discipline this late in life. And, um, but removing privileges, you know, in their teen years, especially if it involves, involves technology or car keys, um, something that is viable to where you get to their heart. Because if you're like, okay, well, you're not going to get chips, you know, anymore. It's like, okay, I don't want chips. I'm, <laughs> I'm allergic. It's gluten, you know. It's like, dang, got to find something, you know. Um, and so trying to find something that gets their attention um, is key. And then something that's really helpful, particularly for parents who have older children, older children, like grown children, um, is the, uh, the concept of trajectory, um, you're parenting, um, you've planted soil, you've planted seeds in the soil, and when they grow old, they won't depart from it, is the hope, and understand that just because you see things, looks like it's falling apart right here, does not mean they're going to stay there all the time. There is a trajectory in view. Your child, grown as they are, as they get older, they're on a trajectory, and you don't know the whole story. So that causes me, as I consider this sort of thing, as I'm counseling with older parents, older than me, children much older than my children, is you don't know the end of their story. And you might not be around to see the trajectory change, but pray and love as if this trajectory is not finished yet, that they will come out of this and honor the Lord with their life. So just pray and support in that way, um, that trajectory. Um, And for another time, we can talk about technology and stuff. That's a whole... um, For those who do have teenagers, we do like to unpack some of this stuff at our uh, parent AC on Wednesday nights. It's the third Wednesday night in November and third Wednesday night in December. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully, Lord willing, we're going to be going weekly soon after the new year. Um, And don't be afraid to parent in this area of technology. Um, You don't get a cruise control on this for sure. If you let up, it's just going to keep going and... Keep going and keep going until 10 hours have gone by. And you're like, oh, well, they've been, mm-hmm. have they been on there for 10 hours? Um, and then something about yeah. seven, um, seven, eight years old and younger, um, something I just remember that might be helpful because there's so many young kids in this room, you know, parents, um, is your ch- our children, our four children, so we could just have four that are just different than everybody else's, probably not, 
probably are all the same in this way, is we would notice just a difference in their behavior, just, a, just being obstinate about something, just angsty, ornery, randomly dis, like disobedience. Like, who is this? Like, what's happened? Like, why are they like this all of a sudden? And we, we got to where we could sense that yeah. coming on early. So it didn't catch us by surprise after we learned what was happening. And we would have the conversation. We would just say to each other, all right, we've got two weeks of heavy discipline, heavy boundaries, because they're, they're pushing for control. They're wanting to see how much slack is available. And so they're pressing up against the known authority. They know the rules, but they're just challenging them in a weird way. And so for two weeks, we would, we would have the conversation. Two weeks, let's go in. And you're just very firm. You don't let anything slide. You just, you're very, very, con- very, very consistent on even the small, tiny little things. Mm-hmm. And then that gives you two to three months of good behavior. And then you can kind of like, they're still not cruise control, but you can just kind of like, you're, you're grabbing fruit, right, off the work that you, you sowed in the field during those two weeks. And then you can feel that them not really know how to process that freedom that you're giving them. And you the, just won't have to as much right. after that two-week period, I think, is the point. Is but you're then they get comfortable there, yeah. and they test the boundaries again. you got to go in. Yeah. And, you know, but that was awesome to realize. Yeah. Um, that was really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so, do you want to do Romans? Romans? Yes. And then? So, um, Romans 12, 9 through 19 and 21. This is giving us instructions as believers on how to live in Christian community. And I would say, if your spouse is a believer, if your children are believers, then this applies to our homes, and we can take this information that we've been given in his word, and we can apply it to those contexts. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another in brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm-hmm. Amen. Um, I want you to take uh, just a minute, and I want you to um, write down. This is just for yourself, and, um, and then we will follow up and, and ask you in a couple weeks uh, or sometime soon um, how you're doing on this. Um, Miss Angie Ferris is going to help as she directs our equip, her and Tim, um, to see how you're doing this. But write down one sort of takeaway, one something, and it can it can just be that we brought up something that led you down a train of thought to somewhere some other direction. But something that from our time today, you're thinking to yourself, man, I would love to to change this. I would love to implement this. I would love to start this. I would love to consider this. Unpack what that might be. Um, just briefly as a talking point and, um, and then begin working on that. Take 60 seconds and think through like what's one significant takeaway that you want to try to implement.